Well, hi there, everybody. Uh, welcome to the live stream. I just let Stella out, and she is uh, she's doing exactly what I hoped she would do. <laughs> uh, crawl up the microphone and onto my new hat. You guys, check out the new hat. I gave um, uh, Instagram some options of which hat style I should wear at this uh on this live stream. I always like to wear hats with strong brims because the snakes are kind of attracted to them. Um, and uh, I got a few votes on the look that I should go with, but then I bought a new hat. And this particular look is guy who just moved to Texas and gets punched in the face more often than he expected to be. So uh, that's this basic look. And I think it's perfect for Stella uh, to crawl on. She seems to, she seems to be doing okay with it and, uh, liking the microphone too. Can you guys hear? Okay. Um, all right. Hi everybody. You guys are jumping in. Lori's in Danielle skeptic knowledge. Hi there. Hi everybody. What is happening? Hi Riki and Misu. Oh, what a nice comment. I appreciate that. We are going to... Um, I've got a plan, you guys. Uh, I just want to say hi to everybody. Artful Jackalope. Hi there. Sharon, Ryan King. Northern Lights is in. Northern Lights made some really cool stuff that we're going to talk about in a minute uh, that I'm going to show you guys. Uh, uh, Kahari, we're going to talk about heat mats, um, and just heating your snakes in general. So, um, if I don't address this question, ask it again, when I get to that, the, the point of talking about that, um, about your heat mat, uh, well here, I'll just give you the short answer. Yeah. It's, it should be about, um, a, you know, a third of, of the size, the floor size, if you're using a heat mat. Um, if it's way too small, like the snake can't curl up on it, you probably should get a bigger one. Um, but we're going to talk more about that later. Let's see. Hang on. We're just kind of moving slowly right now as people jump in. Uh, thanks, Lori. Stella is looking pretty good, isn't she? Um, oh, Brock, I'm glad you're enjoying the channel. I'm just going to bring Stella. Stella's a bit of a troublemaker lately uh, in that she, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a great problem to have, but she is so curious and exploratory. Echo is as well. Echo won't be out with us because she's in shed right now. But um, they both are constantly getting into stuff. And so when I have them out, and I have them out a lot, I've got to really be paying attention um, because, you know, they can, they're at the size where they can get themselves lost, but they're constantly wanting to explore new things. And this microphone obviously is a new thing for Stella. She hasn't, uh, she hasn't been on it before, so, or in a long time at least. And uh, so it's very exciting to her. Um, so I'm just going to let her do her thing and I will, uh, save her if I need to. <laughs> She's crawling on the counter right now. I, you know what I need is a second camera that I can cut to, to show you guys <laughs> like my view over there, show you what snakes are getting into. Anyway, um, okay, so... Oh, what's in the glass tonight? <laughs> Good question. Uh, Brandon, thanks for asking, because I completely would have forgotten this. Nothing is in the glass yet tonight, but what I have is um, Ardbeg Wee Beastie. This is, uh, Ard Ardbeg is, I would say, my favorite. Um, my, my favorite uh, scotch maker. And the Wee Beastie, uh, I recommend it. If, if you want to try a heavily peated scotch that doesn't cost an arm and a leg, the Wee Beastie is the way to go. It's really heavily peated. 
um, and tastes a lot better than than the price that you would pay for it. It's only a five year scotch, um, but it's fantastic. Ardbeg, we beastie. Hi Stella, you coming back around? I see you. Why don't you come over here? Come over here and let the people see you. No? Oh come on. All right, I'm trying to get her, but she's she has other plans. Uh. Okay. All right, so uh, let's try this wee beastie because I haven't haven't had this in a while. Oh man, it's so good, you guys! It's if you like peated, like if you like scotch that tastes, and I've said this before, but this type of scotch tastes like leather thrown into a campfire and lightly dusted with garden soil. Mmm. And traces of like old books from from a library. So good. Those flavors don't sound appealing when I say them, but I'm telling you, it's it's great. See Stella coming up. I'm trying to make a decision whether she's going to come over or not. Oh, back up on the microphone. Okay. Um, she'll be coming this way soon. Uh, thanks for the hat compliment, Anna. This is, um, you know, I, I enjoy ridiculous hats. This is not, even though this looks like it's my style because I have the big beard and everything, I am not a cowboy guy at all. But um, I do like ridiculous hats, and I like hats that will support my snakes when they crawl up onto my head. So um, this, is, this is a good one. I found it in Idlewild, California this weekend when I was up there. Uh, D. Brooks, this scotch, this Ardbeg is um, an Isla scotch. So most most peated scotch, or at least well-known peated scotch, is from Isla, um, spelled I-S-L-A-Y. Uh, it's an island in Scotland. Yes, Brandon, you do. You get the medicinal qualities. Ardbeg, Lafroig, um a bunch of those peated scotches are uh, give you sort of a um, iodine iodineish flavor. I would say Lafroy gives you a little bit more of that, um, but you still get it in Ardbeg for sure. There's medicinal stuff too. Again, these flavors do not sound like they would taste good, but I'm telling you, if you like those flavors, it's fantastic. Um, and also, some people hate it. So there's that. Root Optics, do you live in Idlewild or are you just familiar with it? Um, Hi, Keith Harper. Good to see you in here. Yeah, she is. She decided to not crawl up the mic stand and to turn around and go down the counter. So now I have to keep one eye on her uh, and I'll bring her back shortly. So let's talk about. um, Let's talk about these shed keychains really quick that Northern Lights made. This is Tammy, but she goes by Northern Lights and she's she's in the, she's in the, uh, she's on right now. So look at these. So this is shed from, uh, this is Dolly's shed, I believe. Hold on, let me see if I can make this. There we go. So this is like a little piece of jewelry or a keychain, And um, I sent Tammy s- some sheds. She actually has a bunch of my sheds now. And she dries them out. She sort of there's a process of uh, processing them and then drying them. And uh, and she puts them in these little. It looks like a little bottle cap. So there's one of Dolly's, and then here's one of uh, Evie's right here. So Evie is a bigger snake. Look at the look at the uh, scale size difference on these two. These are both ball pythons, but different sized snakes. This might be different parts of their body too, but still uh, very different sizes. Um, hold on, I gotta save. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm still here. I'm just right on the other side of the camera trying to grab my runaway snake. There we go. Okay. I'm gonna see if I'd like to keep her out uh, this whole time, but it may not work. We'll see if I can keep her with me for a little bit and then maybe onto the tree. And if she'll stay on there, then then that'll be great. Uh, so the point is that these, if you guys are interested in these with from your uh, snake shed, I put in the description of this video, I put Tammy's 
email address, um, or you can just talk to her. Again, it's Northern Lights on here. And uh, you can send her a snake shed, and she'll make jewelry or keychains or whatever out of them. Um, it's really cool. I like them. They look fantastic. Um, okay, and I think they have Northern Lights. Tell me what's going on with the sparklies. I think either... I think maybe it's the plastic that's over the shed that has that has sparkles on them. Um, sorry, guys. If I move too far away from the mic and you can't hear me, let me know because I do that sometimes and I forget that I have to be talking into a microphone. Um, okay, so... Doing things with your snake sheds is really cool. It's it's nice to especially like if it's a if it's a um, a significant shed. So that would be like a snake that never has a good shed, and all of a sudden they have a perfect one. That's a cool shed to make things out of. Or um, I I just sent Tammy Freya's pre lay shed, so that's cool to make stuff out of. Um, you know, maybe your snake was sick and is just getting over whatever they had and, and a lot of times they'll shed because they were sick and they're kind of getting rid of that stuff uh that's a cool thing to like mark the the health of your snake after they got better and then shed um she's just going crazy this one hi can you come back out and, and i'm gonna put you on the tree i'm gonna let you climb okay come here she this one you know there's a rule that, that a lot of people go by where it's like, oh, just just handle your snake once a day, just like one time a day for 15 minutes or whatever. This is like the fourth time that she's been out today. Um, just because she's been up and moving around. She's super active. And let's get you on. Let's get you on a. Let's get you on a little climbing situation. Um, oh, she's not going to do it. She's going to climb my arm instead. We'll just see how this goes. Oh, there we go. So, uh, Stella is super active, and she's taking the opportunity. Usually, I have Stella and Echo out at the same time. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. Stella tries to use Echo as a rope, and I think she's doing it on purpose because Echo never does it to Stella. But when she sees Echo, she goes right over and crawls over the top of her or if if echo is like spanning is kind of like being a bridge she'll uh she'll grab her her body and, and try to you know with her body not with her teeth but um she's always using her as a rope and i don't know if that's like a if that's like a um do dominance thing or what i mean i don't know but there she goes so i'm gonna keep an eye on her and make sure, hang on one second. You just have to make sure those doors are really well closed. I'm working on a video right now that's all about snake proofing your house so that you can let your snakes roam. Um, so, oh, and let me, t let me just tell you guys, do I have it here? Because I saw some of you were already asking Northern Lights how to how to get a hold of her. It's let me just tell you what it is. It's in the like I said, it's in the description of this video. But the number two, Northern Lights with a Z. So Northern L I G H T Z at Gmail. Two Northern Lights at Gmail. Um. Okay, there we go. We got that, and now let's. Oh, good. She's up on her um. Let me see if I can show you guys. Because I always talk about this cliff, but the camera, it's never in frame. Let's see if you can see. Boom. So there's the top cliff. I don't know how well you can see her, but she's up there. She's, you know. And a lot of times she will, um, here, hold on, let me get back. Is that worth it? Probably not. But uh, anyway, a lot of times I'll see her moving around her enclosure, wanting to be active, and then I bring her out, 
and she goes right up to that cliff and falls asleep. So she just likes to be on that cliff. Uh, all right, let's talk about. I've got a whole. I've got. I've got my notes here, you guys. So let's talk about heating. Um, this is interesting. I did a poll. I I did a poll of the horde of keepers over on Patreon, and uh, the, asking them about how they heat their snakes. So there was only three choices. This was a really quick poll that I did last night. Forty six percent of the horde of keepers said that they used just belly heat. 21% said that they just use heat from above. So that's a, a heat lamp, a CHE, a, a deep heat projector, something like that from, from above with no uh, belly heat. And 33% said that they use both belly heat and sky heat. You know, heat from above. So the reason that I want to bring this up, it's funny, it, it seems like each time I do a live stream, there's always a theme that just occurs because of questions that people have. It's always that I'll get multiple questions like the week before um, or people that are just confused about a thing. So, uh, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll weigh in on, on my vote also. The inspector here uh, for the bioactive, we have belly heat underground and, and I've got a CHE right here and I'm probably gonna change to a deep heat projector. But um, I wanna talk about this because uh, there were questions, number one, about, about how to just how to heat from, from new keepers. And then I keep seeing comments from people. Uh, I don't know if it's one person or, or multiple people. These are, these are people that belong to a Facebook group that, that says that ball pythons or snakes in general, maybe, I don't know, I don't know what it is, um, should not have belly heat and it's bad for them. So I want to address that. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, I've talked about Facebook groups before, but I just want to reiterate that anybody with any level of experience can start a ball Python snake group and they can put whatever they want for rules and, and whatever they say, you know, those are the rules, whatever. And they could be really good at marketing. They could put some really good pictures up and name it something that's a really good name. So it seems super legit and they could have some really good legit information, but also mixed with stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense. So let me say this, um, ball pythons need to thermoregulate uh, their, their bodies, right? Just like any other snake, they're cold blooded, they've got to thermoregulate. So you've got to have some, some warmth and you've got to have uh, some, some coolness. And this can be done in multiple ways. Um, as we saw from the horde of keepers, many of them just have overhead heat. That works really nicely. Many of them just have belly heat. That works really nicely. And in fact, belly heat is how the vast majority of ball pythons live in captivity. Um, I'm saying that because if you think of all the people that have racks, the, not only the, brig, the big breeders that have hundreds and hundreds of snakes all in racks, that, that's all belly heat, right? That's all, uh, I mean, you have the, there are options to do back heat, but most people aren't doing that for ball pythons. Um, you know, this is all, Heat pad, belly heat, no overhead. And these snakes live long, healthy lives uh, in those belly heat situations. And then I would say that probably most just pet keepers also use, use heat mats, use belly heat. And it works great. Um, I, haven't, I actually tried to look it up before I started this live stream. I tried to look up to see what people claim is wrong with using belly heat. I've never seen it before. I've always just heard people say, oh, belly heat's not ideal for snakes. It's not a good thing for snakes. I've heard people say, well, snakes in the wild don't have belly heat. They just use the sun. Um, but keep in mind this, specifically for ball pythons. You don't see ball pythons basking during the day. Um, I can't wait for Dave Kaufman's uh, ball python movie that he's editing right now and hopefully will be up, I think, next month because it's going to give us some really good insight to what he found he was just over there and, and shot a bunch of stuff, um, found ball pythons in the wild and things like that. But uh, the point is that ball pythons are underground. They're in burrows. They're underground. It's, it's warm down there, right? But they're not coming out in the middle of the day basking in the sun like other snakes do. They are under things. Um, so, for instance, in the bioactive here, you can't see the full picture of it, but the inspector spends most of his time underground on his warm side hide. And that simulates what he would 
how he would be in, in the wild, basically. He, he goes all the way underground and sits on a heat mat. Uh, and, and if I didn't have that heat mat, you know, if, if this was Africa and he went that far underground, it would just be warm down there and it would be fine. He, he wouldn't necessarily have heat coming up onto his belly. He would just be generally a decent heat for, for digestion. But if I had this exact same setup and decided to follow a Facebook group that said heat mats are bad, then the inspector would go all the way down to the glass and the glass would be cool because glass cools. Uh, and he would, he wouldn't be warm enough The the CHE from above would heat the general area on his warm side, but not all the way down underground where he, where he's sitting at necessarily. So my setup requires a heat mat. Um, and many people's setup requires a heat mat to give the snake the belly heat because an overhead heat situation is not enough for, for those snakes or in a, in a tub scenario, a rack scenario, uh, overhead heat, uh, just isn't practical. It, it doesn't work. Um, just checking on the snake up there. Uh, so, it's, um, what else was I going to say about that? I forgot. I'll, I'll, um, mention it as I, as I think of it. Uh, oh, it had to do with, it had to do with how to set it up. Um, Oh, oh, I know what it is. It's this, this, uh, had to do with a question that somebody had, and I've had this from a couple people recently, um, is that when I, so the way I set up snakes on a heat mat is I assume that they're going to go all the way down to the mat. So I don't put a ton of substrate over the heat, the hot spot, because what I don't want to happen is for that heat mat to sit there and heat the substrate and get really hot under that substrate. And then the snake moves it and is sitting then at, at a really hot um, uh, heat mat situation. So, and, and the other thing is, heat, you know, if you, have, if you have this much substrate and a heat mat under your enclosure, it's not going to heat through, you know, if you're trying to get 90 at the top of your substrate, it's going to be well over 100 at the glass. And as soon as your snake burrows and moves the substrate and gets down to the glass, they're now sitting at 100. So I think it's really important to um, just move the substrate off of where the, where the heat is. That's why the inspector goes all the way underground. If I didn't have the setup like this in the bioactive, I'd probably have a heat mat maybe on the side of the, of the glass, which isn't ideal, but that's probably what I would do. Um, so knowing that he would probably burrow anyway and that heat mats do not heat well through substrate, I just dig it all the way out and, and he sits on the glass underground. Um, and same with, with all the tubs. When, when I put uh, substrate, when I put Reptichip in the tubs, I move it off the back. So, they, so they're just sitting on the, um, on the tub itself. And that, that is, you know, I, I use a, a temperature gun and I hit that and make sure that that is 88 to 90 degrees. And, um, and then they're all good. So those are the important points that I want to make. As far as this thought that heat mats are bad, um, you know, I've always said there are many ways to keep snakes, uh, many successful ways to keep snakes. And people, again, most people keep them for many, many years, very healthy using just heat mats. A lot of people uh, have great success using just overhead heat. And a lot of people have great success with both. It just depends on your preference. The only one that, that really could potentially be a problem is if you're only using a light. Um, and and that's, because, that's not because lights are bad for snakes. That's something that I hear constantly, and it's not true. Lights are fine for snakes. They're fine for ball pythons. Um, but you don't want to have it at night. You don't want to have it on at night. So if that's your only heat source is a light, and you shut that off, it's okay to have a ball python get a bit of a temperature drop at night, but if you live in a cold house and you have to shut that light off, then it's going to drop probably too cold for the snake. And if you keep it on 24 hours, then your snake doesn't have a, a um, day-night cycle. So that's the only one that could potentially, potentially cause a problem. Uh, the other ones do just great, though. And so this, this idea from, I don't know if it's one Facebook group or if it's a bunch of them or whatever, but this idea that heat mats are bad for snakes is so silly because it's how most snakes live 
their life in captivity and, and live long lives and they do just fine. So I would love to hear from somebody though, why they think heat mats are bad for snakes. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what the reason is. I've never heard it. I've just heard people comment, oh, it's not ideal for snakes. You shouldn't use them. You should only do overhead heat. Anyway, that's all I want to say about that. There's lots of really great ways to keep snakes and not everybody does it the same way and that is okay. By the way, those people who believe that heat mats are bad, there's nothing wrong with that. They can believe that because they're going to give their snake, they're going to have their setup in such a way that their snake's going to do just fine with overhead. So they're not doing anything wrong either. The only thing they're doing is if they start convincing people of that, then it takes the option of a heat mat away. And heat mats work really well in a lot of situations. So I think people should know that, that that's, it's fine to use a heat mat. Um, all right. So I'm going to say on that, unless people uh, had questions while I was giving my diatribe, let me check on the snake and then go through this really quick. Um, okay, people are talking to Northern Lights about these lovely uh, little pieces of jewelry. Here, I saw somebody. So I'm going. I'm going through really fast. So this is the size. This is the size of them. Here's my hand. I have a large hand. Uh, here's the size. Let's see if it'll. Really cool pattern. Anyway. Um, I mean, you could probably, for me, it's a keychain, but you could probably even make it earrings if you like big, crazy earrings, you know? Anyway. Uh, um, Keith, that's, that's a good point. You're asking if it's, uh, if... Stella climbing over Echo could be a play thing rather than a dominance thing. I tend to think it's not play as much just because retics are are not social creatures, so they probably haven't they probably don't really have that in them to to like actually play. Um, but it's obviously something that that Stella wants to do. So I don't know how we define play, but but Stella sees Echo and makes the decision to climb over and on top of her. So whatever that is, whether that's just she wants to do it because it's fun, I guess that would be play, or she's doing it because she wants to exert dominance or whatever. They've never done anything that looks like they're fighting or anything like that. They usually are separate on the on the ladder, but um, it's interesting. Uh, Jay Meyer is asking, did you make that enrichment area or buy the stuff? Uh, are you talking about the ladder? If you're talking about the ladder, um, I bought all the elements and then put them together and made it. Um, if you're talking about this, same thing. <laughs> this is a bioactive uh, enclosure that I built. Um, I'm guessing you're talking about the ladder though. And that changes pretty pretty often as well for the snakes so that they have different, different things because those retics get really used to that thing. By the way, you guys, Maya, my black-headed python, has been using the ladder, which is interesting. I mean, I've I've heard that they are that they can be arboreal snakes. They're usually found on the ground, but they can also go up in trees and stuff. She's very adept at climbing that ladder, and she goes as soon as she's headed up, she's headed up. Um, so it's interesting. She she tries to go back and forth on the top of my my doors and everything. Maybe I'll bring her out if I can get if I can get this snake back in her enclosure. Maybe I'll bring Maya out. Um, and a ball python too. I'll grab a ball python here in a minute. Let me try to get through some of these comments. Um, sorry guys, you know how this is. If you've seen my live streams before, I spent a lot of time just sort of trying to plow through these things. Um, if you have a question that you want me to see for sure, super chat it and I will see it for sure. Um, Otherwise, I, I try to blow through these quickly and answer as many as I can, and I might accidentally miss yours. Um, that hot librarian, thanks so much for the for the Scotch Fund. Uh, by the way, that's um, the hot, that hot librarian who always donates to the Scotch Fund. Um, helped me with in coming up with so I redesigned the Patreon and every member of the Patreon is now part of the horde of keepers and each tier I added a fourth tier and each tier has their own um, name 
like I don't even know I don't even know what they are. Hold on, let me just. So the the first tier is uh, the infallible den of husbandry. Um, hold on, and then uh, anyway, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that that hot librarian uh, helped me come up with some of these. She inspired some of these. Um, some of these names, which I just I just wanted them to be epic names, and we're going to do the Patreon scroll too since we're, since I'm talking about it. Um, I can't find my I can't find my uh, view page. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, you guys. If I can't find this, I'm just I'm just trying to find my actual page as though somebody, oh view your public page okay as though some, you know somebody were coming to my page and seeing it all right tier one is the infallible den of husbandry tier two is the guild of herpetologicians um and i think that high, hot librarian came up with that name the the herpetologicians um thing which i think is great uh tier three is the order of the flaming beard which is very close to what it was before and then tier four is medusa's hairdresser because I figure if there's anybody that would be the best at taming snakes, it would be Medusa's hairdresser, right? Um, that's just my thought. So uh, let's do this, and then I'll get back to the thing. So here, here, th this is the first time you guys are seeing it, and a, a lot of people won't necessarily see this until the first produced video. Here's the horde of keepers, new board. Now, the deal is that... Um, I was considering not doing the mid video Patreon scroll. And the idea was that I was just going to do it on the live streams. Um, but let's see, let me make sure that everybody's on camera. But I heard from a lot of people on my Patreon, a lot of the horde of keepers, as well as people that weren't on the horde of keepers that enjoy the mid video Patreon scroll. So I doubled down on it and um, I added I used to not have the, the first tier, but I figure if this is the Horde of Keepers, which is a secret society, uh, I definitely should have everybody listed, you know, in the Patreon scroll. So not only are we getting not getting rid of the Patreon scroll for produced videos, I've doubled down, I've added people, I've changed the boards. Look at my, look at my artwork. Oh my gosh, you guys, I spent time. I'm not, I don't. I'm not good at art. Um, so anyway, that's that. Uh, I appreciate those guys. We have fun over on Patreon. Um, okay, back to the back to the comment situation. Um, let's see. Uh, so Adam is asking, is the ambient temperature important if the gradient on the ground matches the guidelines? For example, my hot spot sits at 90, but my ambient temp through the tub is about 75. You know, the hot, the hot spot is, is key, except what you want is for your snake to be able to thermoregulate. And what that means is not just going 90 or 75, or say let's say 90 or 70, right? 70 would be too low, but, but you know, you've got those two options you want to have the middle option too so if it's 75 all through the tank and then all of a sudden 90 um that's not a gradient enough so my recommendation is you you probably only have belly heat right now and this is one of those scenarios where you probably will need overhead heat also to do that and that's why i have overheat in the in the bioactive here i've got a chE because he can you know no matter what the temperature is outside here he spends m the majority of his time underground sitting on the heat mat and that's fine but when he comes out especially at night when he comes out i want him to have the gradient so so i want it to be 90 here and then getting cooler getting cooler getting cooler all the way over to about 78 on the on the cold side so that is my thought on that Uh, rebellious army is asking where should i place my probe while i have a basking light on i'll tell you you know there um a lot of people do this differently i'll tell you what i do 
and you're not going to be able to see it, but pretend like this is the side of the tank. Okay, I've, I have my I've, I have my CHE here, but let's say let's say my heat source is right here where my hand is. I'm going to place that probe on the side of the tank. I said pretend this is the side of the tank. It literally is, but what I mean is what I mean. Is, this is the front of the tank. I have it on this on the side. Uh, so I place my probe about midway up, right underneath where that heat is is uh, coming down and I use hot glue. Some people use silicone um, to, to glue the, the probe. Don't put the silicone or the hot glue on the silver part of the probe itself. Just glue the wire down and hot glue will not melt your wire. It's, it's fine and it'll work. So um, that's how you secure it. And then you're gonna, you're going to, this is, this is one of those things where, um, you know, you want the temperature basically to be 90 and I, um, you know, 88 to 90 and, and I measure that with a, with a thermometer hygrometer, but I also heat gun the very different various surfaces on here. And your probe is not going to be set anywhere near 90. It's either going to be way under or way above, depending on what it's reading on the side of the glass right there. Um, but that's the, your, your, um, thermostat setting. It doesn't matter what your thermostat setting is, as long as it reads, 88 to 90 inside the enclosure with one of your other um, thermometers, your, your heat gun or regular thermometer, you know. Um, oh, Stella's on the move again, so I gotta keep an eye on her. Um, okay, uh, Jenny Coggs is answering my question. Uh, was told by certain groups that heat mats don't provide the proper wavelengths that penetrate the snake's tissues, like a DHP, for instance. And those people will fight you to the death over this topic. Yeah, and they're right. A, a DP projector will do great uh, at, at providing certain wavelengths that a heat mat doesn't provide. But here's the really important point with ball pythons. They don't bask. You are never, I promise you, when, when I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make this prediction, I haven't seen Dave Kaufman's edits, but I promise you, he did not find any ball pythons basking. Maybe I'll eat my words, but I don't think so. He didn't find any ball pythons basking anywhere in the middle of the day. Um, so they're just not doing that. Uh, I think it's great at night. If the snake comes out at night and can uh, take advantage of that. Same with UV. I think UV light would be would be great to have. I mean, probably beneficial. It's, it's obviously not necessary. We've been keeping ball pythons very healthy for many, many years without uh, UV, but there's probably some benefit to UV as well, but it's not necessary. And they're, if, if they're not getting their heat, you know, from, from above because they're not basking because they're underground in a bioactive vivarium and not basking it, you know, during the day, uh, then it's, they're just not getting, going to get a, enough heat. And the fact is that they need warmth. Forget the, forget the beneficial, uh, wavelengths, right? Which I agree are beneficial, but they need warmth to digest. And if they don't have it, they're not going to digest properly. You're going to get regurgitations. And if they don't regurgitate, that meal in their belly will just rot and die. Uh, or will rot and the snake will die. But probably what will happen is A, your snake will stop eating because they know they can't digest. Or B, they'll just regurgitate their meal because it's too, too cool. So um, heat just heat, forget the wavelengths, just heat is very important. And that is what a heat mat provides. Aside from that, the wavelengths are great if you can get them to your snake. I think that's a great extra thing. So um, the only thing that those people are wrong about is battling to the death, that that's the only way to do it, you know, and to, and to stop using heat mats because some people set up absolutely needs a heat mat. You, you have to have a heat mat in certain setups. So Again, that's all I'll say about that. Um, hold on, where? Dalton, thanks so much for the for the super chat. I appreciate it. Um, and I see that Lori gave me a super chat too. Did I skip it or have I not gotten there yet? Oh, there. Oh, there it is. I did skip it. Gosh, Lori, you're so sweet. For you always send me the nicest super chats. Um, Darwin surprised me yesterday. He shed after two months of not eating, and just one uh, and just one small rat a week. 
and I ha oh, just one small rat a week and a half ago. It wasn't even thinking about shedding. Um, but as you know, I was thoroughly finally ate. Yeah, because we talked about that. Uh, Maria is spectacular and amazing as usual. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I mean, they'll still shed. It's going to be n not nearly as often when they're off food, but they're, they'll still shed. Uh, I'm really glad that Darwin ate. That's that's really cool. Um, all right, that's where that's where I left off. Um, uh, Andrew is asking, "What's your method for a ball python that will only eat mice?" I, I've done a few videos on this, or or I guess talked about this situation in a few videos. Um, there's there are a few things that you can do. Um, you can uh, you can scent the the rat with with a mouse. And I've done that a number of times um, where you just you just heat up a mouse and heat up a rat and then rub the mouse all over the rat. That's probably the the easiest way to go. Just give that a try. See if that'll work. Um, uh, the other thing the other thing you can do, which works really well, is um, do, do that. Scent the, still scent the rat, but take a hairdryer and blow the mouse scent into your snake's enclosure and don't try to feed them until they come out hunting come out looking for it you know and uh once they come out looking for it they're in food mode and they're probably going to strike at anything so you scent the enclosure with the mouse and you feed them the rat and that works often uh... um anna's asking do your ball pythons like laundry piles mine doesn't ever go for it and didn't know if that was normal or if mine was just particular. Yeah, I think yours is particular. Um, most of them do like laundry piles, but you know, anytime you give them anything like a laundry pile or a new anything to crawl on, a playpen or anything like that, that's a completely new environment for that snake. And uh, all right, she's she's doing well, but she's moving around. It's a completely new environment for that snake. And you know, from the snake's perspective they're now in a new space that could have predators. So things like a big laundry pile could be scary. You know, I think most snakes just go for it. They, they see little crevices that they can crawl into and they, they uh, usually go right for it. But that also could be very scary to a snake. So it could be that situation. Uh, personals, uh, personal info is asking my, me my thoughts on carpet pythons. I love carpets. Um, and I would have one if I had the space. I'd probably have a few if I had the space. I did, for those of you that follow me on Instagram, I, I posted a reel on Instagram with a carpet python that I saw at a festival. Um, a guy who, who brings a bunch of his snakes out and does kind of a little show with his snakes. He had a carpet python. And uh, that carpet python took a liking to my hat, as all the snakes do. And uh, I, so I did an Instagram reel. I love them. Um, Hey, KT, thanks for, thanks for showing up. We are drinking, I already went over it, but I'll go over it again for you. We're drinking Ardbeg Wee Beastie. It's lovely. By the way, let me grab a snake because since I put Stella down, I haven't had a snake in my hand, so let's do this. Tiger Lily spent some time out with me today already, uh, but she was the easiest one to, to grab. Um, I did a reel with her today also. She's just waking up. So, Um, Vicious Cube is asking, have you ever had a ball python come way out of their enclosure during feeding? I had this happen last time I fed and was wondering what a good approach to stop that behavior would be. Um, well, the, I guess the approach to, to avoid it or to, to not have it happen would be to feed them, you know, you, you want to offer inside, like over their enclosure rather than having them strike way out for it. But I usually, I usually just deal with it if it happens I grab, I don't try to grab them with my hands because it's very awkward when they're feeding. So what I try to do is just grab a hook or something that where I can lift them up and, and move them. If they feel the, my warm hands grabbing them, that's gonna, that's gonna um, feel 
like it might be dangerous. You know, they're in the middle of eating, so you don't want to be messing with them too much. But if you can just take a hook and or, or anything that can lift them back into their enclosure, that works totally fine. I do that a lot. Um, but you can also avoid it altogether just by just by how you how you offer, you know, make sure to, to offer inside their enclosure. Um, Dalton, thanks again for the super chat. You didn't ask a question, though. I don't know if you had a question. Um, Artful Jackalope, thanks for the compliment that I am, in fact, good at art. Uh, you don't know how long it takes me to, uh, to do that and how many times I have to erase stuff that I messed up. Um, let's see, Sharon, thanks so much for the subscribe. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate everyone subscribing. We just hit, uh, 7,000 subscribers, which I think is pretty good for the length of time that this channel has been a channel. Um, Uh, Liza, that's a good question. Do you feel like the ethics of the ball Python world is changing standards of care, breeding health issues, et cetera? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that, that the ethics are always, it's not that it's not so much that, that it was unethical before. It's just that we know more now than we did before. You know, that's, I think that's how it's always going to be. Reptiles take so long to, to really learn about and, um, you know, once we learn new things, it, it takes a while for everybody to, to be on board with it, you know, to jump on board. Um, so let's say, for instance, you know, we're, we're now experimenting with UV for ball pythons. And uh, the jury is still out as to whether it makes any difference at all. And most of us are saying that it probably is good for them, but we just don't know to what extent. If we found out that it made a huge difference in their quality of life. And like, you could really tell that, that, that UV was a great thing. Um, I think that the hobby would slowly, gradually move toward getting ball pythons on UV as kind of a standard thing, but it would take some time. And I think that's what's happening is we learn new things and, uh, and then the, the hobby slowly changes. Um, and that probably is the way it is with just about any animal, you know, uh, ex exotic animal that we're still learning about. Um, okay, so Tiger Lily is messing up my microphone at this point. And so with her, <laughs> for those of you who were here at the very beginning and saw Stella crawling on the mic, speaking of, oh, I see her, uh, saw Stella crawling on the mic. That's no problem. I just let her crawl on the mic. She can do whatever she wants because she is a arboreal snake or a semi-arboreal snake. With Tiger Lily, she will fall off this mic. So I'm going to um, keep a hand on her and uh, try to not let her fall. Just sort of spot her. Um, okay, so... Dalton, hi, Bob. I just got a baby super dwarf reticulated python. Congrats. That's awesome. Do you have any advice? Um, you feel is important that no one shared with you before you got yours. You know, um, I don't know that there's advice that nobody shared with me just because I did so much research on them long before I, I got one. But um, I would say that you want to, the, the feeding is different for them. And I, th I think that's the thing that, that even though, even though I learned about the differences in feeding, it took me a while to, f to figure it out. You just don't want massive lumps in their belly. You know, you can, the babies, you, you can feed them once a week like you would a ball python, but you're not going to feed them like a ball python. You, you want to feed them smaller meals. Um, a small lump in their belly is, is fine. So with a ball python, you know, I have no problem feeding a meal that's a little bit bigger than the thickest part of their body and giving them a nice lump. Um, I don't do it every time, but, but if I do it, they can take it. No problem. Um, the super dwarves, you, you want to grow them slow, it's slower than that. Um, so that would be, that would be my advice. The, uh, the reason, by the way, that it's important to talk about the, the reason is that you want them, the, these are lean athletic snakes. You also want to give them as much exercise as possible. Um, I do that with all my snakes, but, uh, the retakes, especially you want them to be able to climb around 
and really do those crunches and ab work, you know. Um, they are a lean, muscular snake, and uh, they found that, you know, whether even though, you know, you're probably not necessarily going to breed this snake, but just as an example, um, the super dwarf retics that are, that are a little bit overweight, when they... Uh, when they go to lay eggs, a lot of times they get egg bound if they're not in really good shape. So it's better to grow them slow, keep them in good shape. And, uh, cause that's how they would be in the wild. So that's what I'll say about that. Um, theater Sabs, how do you decide the names for your snakes? I, um, names are important to me. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of, uh, keepers that don't care about names. Like they'll either not name their animals at all, which that's okay, I guess. Uh, or they'll just tell somebody, Hey, pick a name. And you know, somebody calls out some ridiculous name and that's the animal's name for the rest of their life. Uh, it's more important to me than, you know, uh, so I, I usually spend some time. I don't name them right away. I, I wait till something comes to me, you know, um, it might have to do with their personality or their look or whatever. Uh, I've told this story before, but Tiger Lily is the only snake that I didn't name. Um, my One of my students, who I teach ukulele to, she takes care of my snakes when I'm gone for more than four days at a time. She comes in and, and changes waters, and she really loves the snakes. And and Lucy, when, when Tiger Lily here hatched out... Uh, I mentioned, I was like, man, it's going to, I, I got to come up with a name for the snake. And Lucy goes, I want to name it. And I said, like, I, I wanted to say, okay, sure, go ahead and name it. But what I said was, I go, I mean, you can try, but I'm really picky about names and I'm probably not going to take the name just because I'm so picky about it. And she goes, how about Tiger Lily? And I went, okay, <laughs> sold. <laughs> That's the name. So uh, that was, Lucy came up with that really quick and it was a perfect name for the snake. So, um, Artful Jackalope is asking, which of my snakes is my favorite? That's not a thing that I can answer. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's really hard. I, there, you know, these snakes have their own personalities. I would, say, I, I can say this: that if I only had one snake, um, of the of the snakes that I have right now, if I only could have one species, it would be the super dwarf reticulated python, and that is just because they are so interactive. And um, so interested in what what I'm doing. I mean, you guys see me even in the produced videos where I have the snakes crawling on this thing and they're trying to climb onto me. They always want to know what's going on with me. Um, they're just a lot more interactive, uh, and I want to say more intelligent. I mean, they say that the reticulated python is probably the the second smartest snake in the world, um, the king cobra being the first. I don't know how you measure that, but they are very smart. So I would say that, but um, I can't say what my favorite snake is in my group because I just love them all for different reasons. Um, uh, 17 by zero, 17 times zero. Uh, concerning some of the old and recent news of certain parties in Florida potentially banning reptiles and exotics, do you feel that this ban, if passed, would affect other states? Other states, if so, how? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, um, it sets a precedent, and other states for sure would would follow suit. So it's really important, even if you don't live in Florida, it's really important to support U.S. Arc Florida uh, to um, uh, mount a fight against what's happening just specifically in Florida. And also, I'm glad you brought this up because I would have forgotten otherwise. Uh, if you go to usarc.com right now, they I just got an email from them and I haven't seen the details, but they've basically come up with a really easy, quick link where you just click the link and you put your name and your address and whatever, uh, and you can write a specific message and hit send. And then USARC will, their, the app that they created will find your senator and email them. Your, all the information that you put down. So it's the easiest, quickest, like two minute way to get to your senators. They'll send it to both of them and it works really well. Uh, Robert Whittier, I hatched my first twins last weekend. That's awesome. Congratulations. 
that's so fun. I hope they, I hope they do well. I'm guessing that they're tiny. Um, Sprinkles, thanks so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Hey, Bob, do you ever feed ball pythons other types of protein, such as button quail, chicks, other types of rodents? Um, also interested if you do this with your black-headed python. By the way, I love your channel. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, not so much the ball pythons. They, although the ball pythons do, I do mix it up between rats and mice. They, they do get some mice. Um, I, I just happen to have mice because I have one snake that only, that's just a mouser. And, um, so I have mice and, and sometimes I, I mix it up, uh, you know, and I, th I think that's good for them. Um, I have, I've gotten Delilah once to take a Reptilink and have I fed anything else to them? No, I had a Reptilink that when I was, when I was trying to get Echo, to take reptilinks, she refused at first, um, and Delilah will eat anything, so I got her to, to eat a reptilink. Delilah is my pastel freeway girl um, that I have news on, but I'm not going to divulge the news here because it's going to be in a video, a produced video soon. Um, you'll hear more about Delilah. She's in shed right now. She's actually right here next to me in a thing, and I could pull her out, but she's in shed, so I'm going to leave her alone. Um, so the black headed Python gets a mix of quail chicks and same, same with, same with the, um, retail. Well, no, the black, the black headed Python gets iguana reptilinks and she's the only one that gets that because black headed pythons in the wild eat 90%, um, uh, reptiles. So iguana reptilinks are really good for her and birds are really good for her. That, uh, uh, um, Dale chick has about the same pro protein that, uh, iguana would have, which is compared to a rodent, it's way less protein and way less fat. So there's just not as much in it for them. And with the blackhead, I feed Maya every three to five days. So she's getting smaller meals more often, and usually either a bird or an iguana reptilink. Um, but she also gets occasionally I feed her a, a mouse or a, or a rat. Um, so she gets she gets it changed up, and same with the retics. They get they get it changed up. They just don't get iguana reptilinks. They get um, they get a I think it's called Mega Blend is the uh, is the reptilink situation. Uh, speaking of reptilinks, I just signed up to be a reptilink ambassador, and they gave me a a code for people to use, but I didn't see where it's a discount code necessarily. They they have this program that I think some other company uh, came up with, and so and before I say what the code is and whatever. I just want to make sure that there's incentive for you guys to, to use that. Cause if there's not a discount, then it, then I, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to like make commission off of people buying reptilinks, but, uh, I don't recommend them for ball pythons. I think they're really healthy for ball pythons, but I don't think that you should be feeding that different of a, of a prey item to a ball python. They probably won't take it for one thing. And if they do take it and decide they like it, you may not be able to get them back on, you know, if you feed them a bunch in a row, you may not be able to get them back. So uh, I think for ball pythons, it's better to stick with mice and rats, but for other snakes, other types of snakes that'll just eat anything, reptilinks are super healthy. Um, all right, so I talked for a really long time on that one. Alexandria, did I name your snake? I think I did. Daryl from Accounting. I feel like I remember that I named that snake. That's great. Uh, I'm glad you went with that. So I think Daryl from Accounting is a great name for a snake. Again, I'm keeping a hand on Tiger Lily because she will fall off my hat. She's trying to get back onto the mic. Um, if Stella was on my hat right now, I'd have no problem. But Tiger Lily, a bit of... Uh, what are you what are you what are you picking up on there, young lady? You got that tongue going. Um, okay. Uh, Robert Whittier. Uh, I don't name any of my snakes. Their name is their genetics. Pastel leopard. Yeah, th I think that's what a lot of people do. They just they just refer to them by their genetics but you do a thing that i do also which is uh wait where is it I'm, i lost it uh males are all bubba and females are all girly 
And yeah, so so with these snakes, you guys look at her sides, by the way. I love how it looks like an eraser came across the bottom and just erased her sides. It's so cool. Um, you know what, young lady? So I talk to my snakes all the time, and I rarely refer to them by their actual names. Um, it's always some sort of, you know, like young lady. I just call them young lady a lot. Uh, unless they're a gentleman, then and it's something else. Uh, let's see. Crystal Moon, congratulations on your new snake. That's great. Just adopted a new snake on Friday. That's fantastic. Oh, no. I just, shoot. I keep accidentally skipping stuff. If anybody super chats and I skip it, that happened to me once, and uh, I felt really bad, so don't let me do that again. Uh, Lewis Nunn, you can't get Reptilinks in the UK, unfortunately. I don't know if there's a company working on that. There should be. There should be a company that's copying what Reptilinks is doing because it's so good. It's For those of you who don't know, Re what Reptilinks does is they use whole prey animal, and it's basically sausages uh, that, are, that are whole prey. So it's like quail and rabbit and um, uh, what else? Guinea fowl. Um, all kinds of different things. And then the iguana ones are specifically for reptile eaters, and that's just iguana, whole prey. So it's organs, bones, everything ground up, super healthy for the animal. And when I feed a reptilink um, to, to my snakes, they skip the next week. It's, it's so much protein. This isn't, not the iguana ones, that's different. But the, the um, mega blend, which is a bunch of different animals in, in, a, in a link, that's so much protein for them that they can skip the next week of, of feeding. So uh, the link costs probably twice as much as a, uh, as a rat of that size, but you skip the next week. So, so that's the deal with that. Um, Brandon, thanks so much for the super chat. Really nice of you. I love this fringe hobby. Fr not French. Fringe. I love this fringe hobby we find ourselves in and the stories as to how people came to love these animals. How and when did you start your journey? Um, I started my journey when I was a young lad. And my first reptile was... Well, my first reptile was um, a snake that I, that I caught. Uh, um frogs that I caught, salamanders that I caught. I grew up in Spokane, Washington, and we lived out in the valley, um, and there was a meadow across the street from my house, and uh, was constantly catching frogs and salamanders, and the occasional snake. Um, but I think my first reptile that I, that I bought at a pet store, I think it, maybe it was the iguanas. I had two iguanas for a while, but I've had a lot of different things. Um, I would say that I, for, for most of the time, I've been a lizard person. Uh, love lizards. They're great. The reason that I'm a snake person now, and it's, and I've developed a really, you know, great fondness for them. Um, the reason that I'm such a snake person now is that I spend a lot of time out of town and lizards, you have to feed a lot more often than snakes. So, um, when I decided to st get another, I, I'd gone, I had gone a number of years without anything, without any animals, uh, because I tour a lot. And uh, at one point, I decided that I would get a snake because you can, you know, you can leave them for a week and they're totally happy. Uh, so that's what started it, snakes for me. I'm gonna just pull her off. There we go. Um, I think that, that I think that's a common story with people that that really love reptiles is that they were catching them as kids, you know. <laughs> um, Jake, I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. That's awesome. Um, and congrats on your new snake. Uh, it sounds like you don't have it yet, but you're getting the setup ready. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> sprinkles my daughter names all our animals some are refrigerator hot dog meow oh meow meow boop flashlight and tre tres leches 
That's great. Those are great names. Um, kids, kids, animal names are fantastic. Um, Anna, <coughs> excuse me, Anna, I think you should uh, show your housemates my videos of, I have three videos that are um, introducing people to snakes that are afraid of snakes, because I answer a lot of questions that your housemates might have. Um, oh no, it skipped, see this is what's happening, is skipping occasionally, there we go. Avon, Evan, A-E-V-A-N. I'm going to say Avon. Uh, thank God here in the Philippines, heating is not a problem. Oh, you know what I can do is just that. I always forget that I can do that. Uh, yeah, so in the Philippines, in tropical areas, um, the, you, you don't need heat, right? You just, you just do ambient heat in the room, and that totally works all year round, which I think is great. No belly heat needed, no overhead ne heat needed. You just throw them in an enclosure, and they're good to go. Um, Bo, thanks for the compliment. It's, it's a new hat. It's a new hat. It's pretty ridiculous, but, uh, but I like it. It's, um, just checking on Stella up there. She's still doing well. Uh, Robert, thanks. Tiger Lily, she, you know, she is changing every shed. She gets a little bit, she changes a bit, but she's still so super bright. I mean, I would, if, if there was a possibility for her to be Super Orange Dream, I would probably think she is, but but she's not. There's only one copy of Orange Dream available to her. Um, she is she's getting a little bit of speckling in, in between the the brown stripies, but uh, man, she's she's just a stunning young lady. I'm really interested to see what she looks like as a full grown snake i'm sure that she'll fade out quite a bit but um she's still really really pretty um, dalton uh dalton is asking have you tried open 14 it's my favorite scotch yes i love open 14 um that's a great scotch uh i almost bought a bottle of it the other day and didn't but i really like it it's good stuff Um, Robert is asking, shoot, oh. you guys, every time, oh, there it is. Every time I touch this thing, it, it blows the, the comments out. Um, Robert's asking, what is, uh, what is good size bioactive enclosure for an adult ball Python was looking at a 72 by 36 by 36. Is it too big? No, it's not too big. I think, you know, go, go as big as, as you can and, and just make it, if it's bioactive, there's, there should be tons of plant clutter and stuff like that that'll be just fine um plus the bioactive will take a lot of room you know if you're gonna if you're gonna build a background onto it and stuff like that that takes a lot of floor space um so that's it's a good size Root Optics uh, is saying smash the like button. That's really nice. I appreciate that. Yeah, hit like if you guys are enjoying this, if you're sitting here through it. Um, oh, you know what? There's, I need to, <laughs> I still have stuff on my list here, you guys, that I haven't even gone with. Okay, so let's let's go with the Horde of Keepers has uh, a few questions. Let's Let's, let me blow through this really quick. Uh, real quick, first, I'm going to get to Sprinkles Super Chat, which I really appreciate. Testing your Super Chat catching skills. Uh, so do you have any other types of snakes outside of pythons, boas, hognose, or any other reptiles currently? Um, thank you so much for that Super Chat. I don't. I just have the pythons. Um, that's all I've got. I, I, love, I love boas. I love hognose, stuff like that. But I have chosen right now at least to just specialize in a few species of python. Um, okay, 
So I'm going to jump off of this really quick and go to the printed out things from the Horde of Keepers over on Patreon. Uh, Franca, asking about natural behaviors and ball pythons and how to encourage that. Um, hold on. Oh, I see, oh, I see what I'm... I, I wrote notes on this. Um, so, so what Franca is asking is, um, there, you know, they're how to encourage natural behaviors in your snake. And, you know, it's tough because as keepers, you know, we're keeping a snake that normally would be in the wild and we're putting them in a box and they're, they're basically living in a box and they're hanging out with us, which is not natural for, for the snake. And so a lot of behaviors, in fact, I think the Harpers are asking about that too, and I'm going to talk more about that, but a lot of their behaviors are learned behaviors. You can have them do natural stuff, like for instance, the subterranean hide that I was talking about for the inspector. He goes down underground and he stays there most of the time. That's what he would do naturally in the wild. Um, but I think as keepers, the important thing is to make them, these are snakes that are born in captivity, Hopefully they're, I mean, I guess sometimes you, you might have a wild cod or something like that, but uh, for the most part, they're born in captivity and they're going to live in captivity and you just want to make it as comfortable as possible for them. So uh, it's cool to, to do something, you know, a snake in the wild, a, a ball python in the wild is going to sit underground most of the time. So uh, in this bioactive situation, I'm allowing him to do that. Uh, as far as feeding, I know a lot of, you know, a lot of people argue that they feed live because they're encouraging the natural behavior of the snake to eat live. But I'm telling you, a ball python is an ambush predator. And they, so when I feed the inspector, sometimes he gets alive because if I have to, if I'm trying to get Lucille to eat, you know, if, if Lucille hasn't eaten, um, I'm, I'm saying Lucille, it could be any snake, but I'm saying Lucille just because uh, I think it most recently happened with her. I'll try a live with her and if she refuses, I'll throw it into the, the inspector's enclosure. And what he does usually is he comes out of his hide and he sits there and waits for the rodent to run by and then he grabs it. That is also exactly what he does when I feed him frozen thawed. He sits in an ambush position and waits for the frozen thawed rodent to run by and he grabs it. So there, I don't think that there's any different natural behaviors really. You know, there, there are other snakes that, that actively hunt more and I guess... Um, I guess that could be a thing, but you can also with, you know, if you have a, if you have a type of Python that naturally hunts that, that moves around looking for it, you can leave a scent trail of the frozen thought and leave it somewhere and, uh, and they'll go find it or, or offer it to them and they'll go find it. Um, so anyway, that was a little bit off, off the topic, but you know, as far as, as far as, uh, natural behaviors, I think it's more about just making them comfortable and, and, uh, making sure that they're healthy and eating and, and displaying natural behaviors of hiding, you know, for a ball Python, if your snake is hiding, they're, they're probably doing just fine. You know? Um, Oh wait, I'm still on this. I'm still reading this. Uh, Frank is also, Franca is also asking ceramic heat versus deep heat emitters. Oh yeah. Um, we, we were talking about that kind of stuff earlier, which is, be which is better. Um, you know, I, I have a tendency to think that deep heat emitters are probably better. Um, although I don't use one, I am going to switch the, the inspector's ceramic uh, heat element to a deep heat emitter at some point. Maybe I'll do that sooner than later. Um, because I think those are probably better. But since I haven't used one, I, I'm not going to say for sure. Uh, I'm guessing that most people would agree with me, though, because I think those do have a... They, they emit different wavelengths that are... That are beneficial. Um, hi, young lady. What are you doing? You wanna, you trying to crawl backwards? I did a, I did a reel on Instagram today with her around my neck and peeking through my beard. She was, she was all over my face and beard this morning. Um, oh, Tracy is saying Tracy, that hot librarian is saying, remind folks to be mindful of snakes outside in the summer. Outside temps are in the shade. Um, 
Oh, that's me saying outside temps are in the shade. Yeah. So in the summer, it's too hot for your snake to be out in the sun for extended periods of time. I mean, depending on where you're at. But remember that when you check your temps, you know, what, what's the temperature outside? And it says that it's 90 degrees. That means it's 90 degrees in the shade. When you're in the sun, it's 90 degrees, but with the, um, the uh, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for? The sun's rays, whatever that word is. Somebody put in the comments what I'm thinking. Um, but, you know, you've got the sun's rays beating down, and it makes it worse. So be careful of that if you're bringing your snakes outside. Okay, the Harpers have several questions. Nature versus nurture, which aspects of a ball python's behavior and personality are governed by which do you reckon? Um, I think most of it for snakes in captivity is nurture because, you know, if I found tiger lily in the wild, she wouldn't look like this for one thing, but she definitely wouldn't be, you know, curiously exploring my hat and crawling all over my neck. She'd be very scared. So, you know, we habituate our animals and we teach them to not be scared of humans and that changes their personality. You know, that, that makes them a snake that uh, probably will not live very long in the wild. So um, most of how your snake behaves is, is going to be nurture. Unless you're a person who, ha you know, has your snake and you, th you throw them in a rack or a cage or whatever and never deal and, you know, never uh, um, works with them or anything, then, then you might have a, a snake that's going to be going to act more wild. Um, but I would say most of it is nurture. I'm trying to keep a hand on her as she, as she crawls around. Um, did you have any luck reviving your dead Govi thermometer modules? Um, yeah, some of them. One of one of them was, uh, one of them was just completely dead. I have a lot of Govi thermometer hygrometers, and I recommend them. I had I have one. I mean, I've got a bunch of them, and one of them just ended up not being a good one, and that's okay. I don't mind. I'll just buy a new one. What would you say is your greatest highlight so far as a reptile keeper and YouTuber? Same question as above, but in regards to life in general. All right, I'm going to make this fast. Um, highlight as a reptile keeper, two highlights. One is finding my two iguanas months later after they went missing when I was young. I was probably, I don't know how old I was, 13, 14 years old, um, something like that. Two iguanas went missing for a long time. Found them in my parents' closet. Uh, that was a highlight. Probably my real highlight though is, is breeding the, you know, getting, getting eggs to hatch. That's a, that's a really exciting thing. A lot of people do it. Um, but when you do it for the first time, I mean, I think it's probably exciting every time, but last season was my first and that was really cool to hatch some animals out to hatch this particular animal out. That was great. Um, YouTube is as far as the the YouTube thing. I mean, I, just the fact that it's that it's growing well. I mean, I don't have any videos that are that are like viral. I mean, I have some that are like twenty thousand views or whatever, but not you know nothing massive. And the the channel is growing steadily. You know, like I said, we just hit seven thousand subscribers, and uh, we've been going for about a year and a half. Uh, and without doing a bunch of clickbaity, crazy stuff, I haven't I haven't. Uh, collaborated with other YouTubers yet, which, which I plan to do in the future, but, um, no collaborations and, and no super viral videos or anything. And it's, it's growing nicely. So it seems like people are, people are enjoying it, which encourages me to continue doing them. Uh, they, they take a lot to, they take a lot to do. So, uh, thanks for watching you guys. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Um, and then, uh, uh, same question, but life in general, boy, that's a, that's a big one. Um, I mean, my kids, I've, I was able to produce some, some human children, which, uh, are fantastic. My, I have three boys and they're awesome. They're grown. Um, so very proud of that. And then I would say the, um, it took a long time to do, but the thing that I do for a living, I do several different things, but they're all things that I love. Um, the, there's like, I don't wake up and have to go to a job that I hate and talk to some manager that I hate or something like that. Uh, I, I teach, teach music. I love music and, and I have some students that I teach. I, uh, perform, um, I go on the road and do, do comedy and perform at festivals. And, um, I'm now doing, you know, I've had a love of reptiles since I was a kid and now I'm doing a thing where I can have a YouTube channel and, and 
use my sort of performing and, and producing skills to, to make some videos that people seem to like and uh, produce some awesome snakes. So that's exciting. Uh, okay. Last question from, from Patreon. This comes from the Harpers also. I like this one. If you could keep a mythical creature or cryptid as a pet companion, would you? And if so, what kind would it be? Such an easy question. Bigfoot, definitely. Have you ever seen Harry and the Hendersons? Come on, that's, that's what I'd keep. Is a Bigfoot. He would be my friend. And uh, we, I'd hide him in the closet when company came over. I would teach him to be super quiet. He would just hide in the closet. Or it's very possible that Bigfoots exist and they're just able to completely disappear and that's why we can't find them. So I would just teach him maybe to disappear when people are around. All right, we are back to questions from the live chat. So here we go. Uh, Crystal's asking, let me see, uh, if it's been a week since I brought my buddy home and left him alone and he's not in blue, is it okay to take the hide off and gently handle him? Um, yes, but I would say try and feed him first. I, what I like to do with, with a new snake is give them the week, give them five, you know, five days to seven days to settle in. If they seem settled in, gently offer them a meal. If they take the meal, then give them, give them a couple days to digest and then you can handle them. If they don't take the meal, I still would not handle. I would give them some more time to adjust another four or five days and then try and offer again. Um, so I, I guess the, the point is that I, I would not handle a snake that hasn't eaten yet. Um, just because they're still adjusting and handling them uh, could, could potentially make the adjustment harder for them. So, hold on, I just, oh my gosh. Uh, I keep losing my spot, but I found it. Thanks for everybody saying to hit the like button. That's nice. I appreciate that. Likes and comments on all my videos are really helpful. Um, and, if, and if you're watching this and not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button. That helps too. We just, um, like I said, we just hit the 7,000 mark, which makes me happy. And it's growing, too. The, sub the subscriptions are coming in faster now. That's, that's the other cool thing that's growing is that, is that the, the, you know, it's coming in steady, but, but a little bit faster each, each month. Um, I get more subscribers, which is cool. That's helpful. Um, Lori may be getting two monkey tail prehensile, prehensile tail skinks. You know what? When I was in high school, there was a pet store that I sort of volunteered at. And the reason was the owner was super hot and I always wanted to go in and see her. And, uh, but also she had reptiles that she couldn't deal with. So like she had a monitor that wouldn't eat. So I would go in and, and assist feed the monitor probably did it wrong, but, um, I was the only one that was willing to handle it. But anyway, she had a prehensile tail skink and I don't, I feel like it was like five or six or $800 or something at the time. This was, this was back in the, I guess, late eighties. Um, and, but I dreamt about that. Like that's that, uh, skink was, I really wanted it, but there's no way I could have afforded it. So I'm excited if you get if you get a prehensile tail skink. Those are really cool. Uh, Lewis is asking if I have any experience with cooler birds. Not not really. I haven't I haven't kept them myself. I've I've handled them a lot, but but I've never kept them. Northern Lights is asking how the inspector is. He's great. He is, uh, he's breeding right now. Well, he's not breeding. He's supposed to be, but he's, he's not. He's just, he's in Lucille's tub at this point. Um, I have a, 
I have a situation with Lucille that I don't think she's going to go this year. And, and what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to pair them so that her appetite, I'm hoping that her appetite gets a little bit better. She, she's eating, but she's only, she's only eating. She's an adult, uh, 1700 gram adult. And she's only allowing me to feed her one jumbo mouse a week. Uh, and I would like to give her at least two. And she's done that before. She just is not eating very much right now. So um, for, a, for an adult ball python uh, that's only on mice, two, two jumbos back-to-back uh, -back is, is fine. I mean, I would rather feed her a rat that's the size of two jumbos, but I can't because she won't take it. So I'm trying to pair her just so that maybe she'll start, you know, thinking about developing follicles and maybe start eating more. Um, I have a I have a adult snake breeding update video coming soon next week I think actually so I'll talk more about that in that video. Um, uh, Lord Summerisle, Lord Summerisle, yeah I think that's what it is. Is asking uh, what do I think about Antaresia? I love Antaresia. They're um, children's pythons, uh, pygmy pythons. Um, do they, did, did they just, uh, spotted Python? I think they're saying now is, is a children's Python. I think they reclassified it, but anyway, those are great. They, for somebody who wants a smaller snake, but they still want a Python. Those are fantastic. I, I really like Antaresia. I don't have any, but, um, I think they're cool. Highly recommend. Um, Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to get through this. Um, <laughs> look, look at Tiger Lily. Uh, let's see. Sprinkle says, I keep most of my snakes in bioactive enclosures with heat emitter panels, and it makes life so much easier. I see them hanging outside their hides more often. Um, that's interesting, yeah, because if, if they don't have the belly heat in their hide, they're probably coming out more to get that, to get that, uh, to get that heat. That's cool. Um, shoot, I just did it again, you guys. Now i got to find where I was at. Yeah, people are mentioning uh, radiant heat panels, and those are great too. I didn't say that. I, I was saying CHE and, and DP projectors, but radiant heat panels are great. I have I have that in uh, uh, Echo's enclosure. Um, those are those are really good. Checking on. Oh, did I almost drop you there, young lady? Sorry about that. I was checking on the other snake that's up on a cliff right now. You guys, I may have just skipped a bunch of questions. I'm sorry if I skipped yours. Um, so Brandy is saying uh, that her ball python loves to climb. A lot of them do. Since they're not arboreal, uh, I'm careful about what I let them climb on. Do you have ideas for higher climbs that are safe? Yeah, higher climbs are not safe for ball pythons. Um, I'll give you an example with Tiger Lily. She was out with me this morning and she, she enjoys climbing on the, on the ladder here. And, uh, I spot her. I keep my hands under her and I keep a soft pad underneath because she will fall. And she did this morning. Uh, she, she fell and, uh, I caught her and she was fine, but she likes to climb. I'm not going to let her do that because I would have to stand right under her right now if we did that, but she enjoys doing it. So, uh, don't have your enclosures too tall. You know, you want to you want to assume that they will fall a bit. The inspector doesn't fall anymore. He hasn't fallen in a long time. But when he first started crawling around this bioactive, he was constantly falling off off the top of that. But he's falling not very far and into soft dirt. Um, so you want to assume that they will fall. And so you're either spotting them or you're putting them in a situation where if they fell, they wouldn't hurt themselves. Um, Uh, 
uh, harsh reptiles. Hey, Bob, I remember if I remember correctly, you're in California. Yep, I'm in Burbank. So am I just wondering if you're going to Anaheim or Pomona would love to say hi. Uh, Anaheim, I'm not going to. I'd love to, but I have a gig, so I will be out of town. And I don't know when the next Pomona show is. I was at I was at the last one earlier this year. I don't know when the next one. I don't know if they have multiple ones a year or not, but um, I go when I can. But in the summertime, I'm I'm gone a lot in the summertime for gigs. Um, but yeah, if you guys see me at a festival, say hi. Um, I love I love meeting people. I I met a Green Room Pythons fan at the um, at the uh, oh I I meant when I said festival I meant show uh, the reptile shows. If you see me at a reptile show say hi but also if you see me at a festival like a renaissance festival or a steampunk festival or something like that say hi um i ran into a green room pythons fan at a festival in oregon that i was performing at two weeks ago and that was really cool because um she didn't know that i was going to be there and it was it was cool to run into somebody outside of the reptile world you know i was doing i was doing my other thing and she recognized me from the channel and that was really cool um so come say hi if you see me somewhere. Uh, Crystal is asking, is it okay to take the hide off of them to handle them? Yeah, um, it is. It kind of depends on the snake. I mean, I, I just did it with Tiger Lily. She was sleeping in her hide, and I rudely pulled her hide off and took her out, and uh, she just sort of woke up in my hands. It's not the nicest thing to do, but, <laughs> but uh, I do it sometimes. And my snakes are all habituated to me. It doesn't, like, that wasn't a super frightening thing for her. I had to give her a little bit of time to wake up, but it didn't completely freak her out. So it depends on the snake. If you've got a snake that that's going to freak them out, then I wouldn't do it. But if they're used to you, you, you could do that. Um, I, don't, I don't do it often. If You know, a lot of times if I want to handle a snake, I'll go through... I'll start pulling out tubs and just see if anybody's out or I can see through the tub. So I'll, I'll pick the, whatever snake is I can see in the front of their tub. If they're moving around, um, I'll, I'll choose to, to, uh, handle them because I would rather handle a snake that's already up and moving than pulling a hide off and, and picking them up. So speaking of this, speaking of uh, pulling a hide up, let me put her back so that she can go back in her hide and maybe I'll grab a different snake. We've got about half an hour left in this live stream. You guys, um, putting her back. Let's get, uh, oh, you know what? Let's do this. Here's a, here's a snake that's a fan favorite. There's another one that he wasn't in his hide, but he was definitely in the back and he's still sleeping but here's bear um here's another thing that i do that that i don't necessarily recommend it really depends on your snake but both tiger lily and bear will be fed shortly after uh this live stream is over and i know them very well and i know that they both will eat so uh you know there's kind of a general rule that's where uh, people say don't handle your snake before you're going to feed them like the day that you're going to feed them don't handle them and I don't really have any snakes that that would affect their eating. I think that there are some snakes that, that are not habituated at all and they get really scared and a handling session for them is super stressful and it could cause them not to eat. Um, but I don't, I don't have a problem handling them the day that they're fed. Uh, I then let them digest. I won't handle them after, you know, for a couple days after, but, um, Anyway, so here's Bear. He's going to wake up and start moving around in a bit. Or maybe he won't. Uh, Marianne, thanks for, thanks for being here for a while. She says, uh, it's exciting to watch your channel grow. I think I've been here since 2K. Again, I keep forgetting that I can do this. Since 2000, I wish you a ton of success. That's really nice. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, Uh, Rachel's asking, how is Lydia Dietz doing? Lydia is doing great. And, oh, in fact, I could pull Lydia out. She's probably, she hasn't been out for, for a little while. Um, Lydia's doing really well. She's, she's a big snake. And, um, oh, in fact, the, I will pull her out because these two, in, no, in about November, I'm going to start pairing them. Um, 
Bear here is uh, about, you're, you're just not waking up, are you? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have you out, but I'm going to keep you out for a minute. Um, hang on. Let me grab Miss Lydia Dietz. Hi there, young lady. Hello. Come here. So Bear is about 500 grams right now, and he will be quite a bit bigger than that by the time November rolls around. And uh, he is a pied het clown, and Lydia is a clown het pied. So they are betrothed. And um, Lydia is a little bit young to be breeding right now, but uh, she is, she's big enough. I think she's 17 or 1800 grams right now. She'll be quite a bit bigger in November and uh, she'll be, she'll be old enough. You know, I just want to give another five months or so before I start pairing them. But, but these two will be paired up and um, they'll have... Uh, Hopefully have little um, cute baby snakes. I'm going to put Bear back, though, because I don't think he's into it at all. He would he would be up and moving around by now if he was into it. So put him back. We'll keep Lydia out. So that's another thing when you, when you work with your snakes is to, to pay attention to their body language, you know. I had him out for several minutes there, and if he's not, you know, when I pulled Tiger Lily out, she was asleep, and she woke up pretty quickly and started moving around and exploring. Bear did not, so that tells me that he's probably not going to be comfortable with me holding him. He, he just wants to sleep, so. Um, anyway. Uh, Uh, Alex, glad you're here. Glad you made it to the live stream. Uh, personal info, uh, where, where did I buy the radiant heat paddle? So my enclosure for Echo is a black box enclosure, and I just order it along with it. So, and I'll do that with Stella also. And um, uh, I might do it for for uh, Maya, my black-headed python's upgraded cage. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do for overhead heat, but she will have overhead heat of, of some sort. I just haven't figured it out yet. Um, uh, Sprinkles, thanks for the other uh, super chat. I really appreciate it. You're saying, do you want an Antaresia Python or a pair? I'd be happy to send. That's, that's really nice. Um, I, I don't think I want another speed. I do, I do want an Anter I do want Antaresia. But I don't think now is the time, uh, especially because I'm expecting to have a whole bunch of babies um, this summer. I really appreciate the offer, though. That's very that's really nice. What kind of antaresia do you have? What species do you have? Um, let's see. Going through. Where did you get your Super Dwarf free tick from? Um, I have two, and one I got from Reach Out Reptiles, uh, which I highly recommend. That if you're, especially if you're, if you don't have a Super Dwarf, um, and you're not, you know, you're you're just doing your research, I would say start off with uh, with the snake from Reach Out Reptiles because they are, uh, you know, you know that you're going to get what what they say it is. Um, and then my other one came from, uh, my other one is a Kalatoa. Stella is 100% Kalatoa, and she's a different line than, than most people have. Uh, I got her from Slither, and Slither got, uh, he got his from an importer that, that imported some Kalatoas right before the ban, right before you, they said you can't import anymore. Um, and so it's a, it's a different Kalatoa bloodline than, than what most people have, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, Brandy, I will not be at the Houston Festival. That's a little far for me to. Oh, oh, you're. Oh, no, you're asking. You're asking about the, uh, the, um, Texas Texas Ren Fair. I don't know if I'm doing that gig or not this year. Um, I haven't heard. 
I don't know. I usually I usually hear last minute. I mean, I've done it the last several years in a row. I mean, I took one year off for um, uh, because of COVID, but other than that, I've I've done it each year, and I usually do three or four weeks of of that festival. I just fly back and forth. I fly out on on Friday and back on Monday. Um, so we will see. Uh, Alex, I don't do anything in Ohio. Other than that Texas festival, I try to stay on the West Coast. I'm doing, like, in a few weeks, I'll be going to um, Utah. That's about as far west as I go, except for that Texas festival. And then other than that, I'm going, you know, I, I do basically Washington State to Southern California. I try and stay on this side of the state because I need to be in L.A. Uh, as much as possible. Um, my agent and manager do not like it when they go to the trouble to get me auditions for things and I have to turn them down because I'm out of town. So, uh, I try to stay in town as much as I can. Okay. I'm cruising through. I'm so I'm on, uh, I'm on people saying hi to bear. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, backed up. Sorry, you guys. Let's see if I can get through some of these. Um, Rachel's eight legged wonders. I don't have experience with doom rolls boas, except to say that I've held them and I love them. I think they're great. Uh, I would, I would almost guarantee that that's a fantastic choice for a pet, but I can only say almost because I I've never had one as a pet, but I think they're awesome and, and probably one of the best boas you can get. Um, Anthony Henry, not not a red stripe clown. This is just uh, Lydia is just her phenotype is just clown. She's het for pied, but she's just, just a clown het pied. And um, I'll give you a good look at her. Let's go this way. She's real pretty. I I love her markings. She's got these super cool ghost faces. You know, clown kind of has the same has a s similar thing, but but it it shows a little bit differently. And she definitely has sort of screaming ghost faces and one where is it on this side this i'm calling this guy a, a mariachi band guy uh hang on i'm trying to see the see the mariachi guy he doesn't have any eyes but he has a great mustache right there so lydia is great um so lydia if i think uh i can't remember who's asking how she is but the, you may have been asking about her health because of that of the video that I put out. Her health is great. She's she's doing fine. I gave her that hide, you know. The result of of her um, ru potentially rubbing her nose. I'm still not sure exactly what that was, but uh, the swelling went down right away. But the re result was I gave her her hide back. Um, she had been without a hide since she was very little, and because uh, she just wasn't using them, and now she uses it. And as a result of that, she's not out with me as much as she was because um, it used to be that I would see her in front of her tub moving around and I'd pull her out in the morning, almost every morning, put her around my neck and make coffee. And now she's she uses that hide again. And um, like, like I was just saying earlier, if she's in, in her hide, I'm usually not going to pull her out unless I need to for some reason. Like if I'm doing a live stream and somebody wants to see Lydia, then I'll pull her out of her hide. But otherwise, I'm not going to just wake her up and throw her around my neck for no reason, you know. Um, let's see. J. Meyer, getting my first ball python next month. That's great. Congratulations. How deep should the substrate be? Uh, kind of as deep as you want. It depends on what you're using. Um, again, I said this. I don't know if you were watching in the beginning of, of this live stream, but one of the things I was saying is that if you're using a heat mat, you want to move the substrate off the heat mat. So um, in tubs, when I'm using tubs, uh, I am not, um, I, it's, it's not that thick, like it's not super thick because I'm, I'm moving it off and, I, and I'm just kind of letting them shift it around. In the bioactive here, you can't see this thing, but it's probably, um, oh, I would say almost six inches of, of substrate. Um, so it just depends on what you're, uh, on what you're using. That hot librarian, Tracy, saying, as an Ohioan, I don't blame you for staying away. <laughs> I like Ohio. I used to do a comedy club. Um, I used to tour comedy clubs 
and I don't anymore. Um, but I used to, because I'm doing festivals instead. But there was a club in Ohio. I can't even finish the story because I don't know what, what it was called. Anyway, it, it was a cool club. I, I enjoy, I always enjoy going to Ohio. But I did go there one winter for a show and it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. And I've also performed in Alaska in the wintertime. But Ohio, that one weekend in Ohio was the coldest I've ever been. It was absolutely ridiculous. Um, let's see. Uh, Sprinkles, thank you so much again for the super chat. You have super chatted so many times. Sprinkles wins the super chat contest. <laughs> She's Every time you comment, you super chat. And I really appreciate it. You don't have to do that, though. But really nice. Of you, I do. It, it does guarantee that I see it, though. Um, oh, it's because oh, you're answering my question and super chatting. Now I feel bad. Uh, I have Spotted's, Children's, Ant Hill, Cape York's. Wow, they are wonderful. I think I'm just finding excuses to send you super chats as I'm super appreciative of your channel. Oh, that's really nice. Uh, thanks so much, Sprinkles. I appreciate that. Um, that's so cool that you have Spotted's, Children's, Ant Hill, Cape York's. I would, um, we should chat. I'd like to know, I don't know much about the, the difference, like, especially the Ant Hill and Cape Yorks. I don't, I don't know much about the difference in, in those. Um, but I really like Antaresia in my mind. And I might be wrong about this, but in my mind, all the Antaresia are very similar. You know, um, they might have different looks, but I think their personalities are similar and stuff like that. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, cause I totally could be, this is just something that I, that's in my brain for no reason. Um, Rachel's Eight-Legged Wonders uh, is asking, do I listen to Snakes in the Fat Man podcast? Uh, I do occasionally. I, I have. I have before. I, sh I shouldn't say. I, do, I don't do it occasionally, but I have. Uh, that he, He's got a good podcast. He's very, um, he's a very high energy podcaster. And sometimes I don't have the, um, to, I, like I, I've got to be in a, in, a, in a mood for that, like super high energy um kind of like morning radio show type of energy that's that sometimes uh is too much for me when i'm when i'm driving uh but he's got great guests and he has a great show it's just that i can't always take the super high energy stuff um nothing and nothing against him by the way i don't that's that's a problem with me that that i can't like I have to deal with a little bit lower energy stuff when I'm, when I'm driving. Um, I, you know what I listen to more as far as podcasts is, uh, Morelia Python radio. Um, I listen to that a lot. Checking on Stella. She's just up there asleep on her, on her, uh, cliff and i guarantee you if stella was in her enclosure she would not be asleep because she would see me right i'm sitting right outside of her enclosure she'd see me here she'd be moving all over the place but now that i have her at the top of the ladder she just falls asleep um luna is asking this is a good question it's hard to answer though for how long a time do you recommend to begin handling a young python to get it to to get it habituated is basically what she's saying. Um, so a young python, let's say um, a hatchling, basically, I would say starting out, um, you want to do ten to fifteen minute sessions once a day. Then, based on there, you kind of have to figure this out based on their personality, right, and based on how you think they're doing. Um, and and this is things like. Uh, just body language are they really tense when you're holding them will they will they relax pretty easily and just start just start exploring around if so um you can you can maybe do it twice a day or better yet go with like a 20 minute handling session um and uh you know don't don't handle them when they're in shed don't handle them for a couple days after they eat you know those general rules but other than that you know give them a session uh you know, one that one that I kind of monitor, um, and I guess so. I'm talking about Maya, my black-headed python. She she never gets stressed really. Like she's she's never been stressed or defensive when I handle her. 
but I do, but I try to handle her regularly um, to get her to to reinforce the fact that I'm not food. And she hasn't tried to bite me in a, in a long time, but I still she's not to be trusted, and uh, I still think that she'll she'll tag me at some point. But um, and she ha- she has before. Uh, but I don't want her, she's growing really fast and I don't want her to be a big adult black headed Python and striking at everybody, you know, because she thinks they're food. So I handle her for about 20 minutes a day, every day that, that, um, I give her 24 hours after she's eaten, um, because her meals are smaller and they're usually something that she can digest pretty fast. So I give her about a day after I've fed her and then I try to handle her just about each day for about 20 minutes and then I put her back. Um, and I don't know how long, you know, I, I, I don't know what the results of that are going to be. Like if it's, if she's eventually going to be a snake that I can just have out for a long time, I don't think she ever will, but maybe she will. Um, okay. Sprinkles is saying some size differences, uh, small pattern differences, but other than that, pretty much the same Cape Yorks are just a locality. That's what I thought. Um, and known as blonde, known as the blonde max. I didn't know that. Um, that's interesting, but pretty much the same as the others. Yeah. I thought that's why I was thinking that personality wise, they're, they're about the same, such a cool species though. Um, let's see. Shaylee Davidson. Thanks so much, Shaylee. I hope I'm saying that right. Thanks so much. I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. That's really nice. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, <laughs> you guys are talking amongst yourselves, but Lori W. is Lori Weiser, and um, Lori has one of the snakes that I produced by the name of Marie. Um, who's such a cool snake and I love, and Lori, I love when you post pictures of Marie. It's really cool to see her growing. Um, but Lori's a fantastic snake keeper. Um, and Lori Torini is the, uh, the behavior, animal behavior expert, um, who is currently working with, oh, I've had this Rachel's eight legged wonders. I'm sorry that I've had your comment up for so long. Um, (laughs) It's a no, I, I do that a lot when I when I put these comments up. I forget that they're up and then they just sit for an hour. Um, anyway, Lori Torini is fantastic. She Lori Torini gave me um, I I messaged her the other day and told her that I was working on a video and uh, I asked her basically for some anecdotal input, just a couple of little things, and I figured that she would in the chat that we were writing she would just give me like a paragraph. She sent me like a three page document. She went home and wrote a document. She is, Lori is so thorough with her uh, snake training and such like that. But she gave me some really good information and it will be included in a future video. Um, We've got to, we've got to end this pretty soon, you guys. I am teaching a ukulele lesson in about 10 minutes. Rachel's eight legged wonders is asking now watch this. Now I'm putting her comment up again, but then I'll, then I'll, uh, put it on high. So, uh, I'm considering a super dwarf eventually. How has the temperament been in your experience? So, and then look at that. Now I take it off. I got to remember to do that. They're great. I said this before. You may not have been in the, um, you may not have been watching when I said it, but, uh, Super dwarves are, their temperament is really good. Both of mine, now, Echo is um, uh, 50% Karampa. And one of the sort of personality traits of Karampa is they're super laid back and don't tend to bite at all. Uh, that's hard. I mean, that's, that's, that's what Garrett says. Garrett has most of the Karampas in the United States, and that's his experience with them. Um, but it's still a small group. Uh, and that is the case. Um, Echo has tagged me twice because she thought I was food and it was my fault. I just, I just assume she's not going to bite. So I reach in without even looking at her and in food mode, she'll go, she'll strike and then, and then let go right away. It's no big deal. Um, and Stella 
I'm more careful with Stella, but she has never struck at me. But she does come out of her enclosure in food mode a lot, so I, I hook train both of them. Um, but really inquisitive, really smart, interactive snakes. They're really cool. Um, okay, I think I'm at the end of this, you guys. I am. Great. Clint's giving some... Uh, Clint Martin is giving some good advice on... All heat sources should be run with the herm uh, thermostat. Absolutely. Um, people are asking where Kent and Future Bob are. You know, generally, it would be impossible for Future Bob to show up because we're doing a live in now times, so Future Bob wouldn't be able to show up at all. Really tough for Kent to be here as well. Uh, when I have snakes out and moving around and such like that. Uh, plus, he would just... He would just ruin the video with nonsense, I think, is what would happen. Although I did say in a video a long time ago, uh, I made Kent promise that he would show up in a live stream at some point, and we haven't done that yet, so we need to. Maybe we'll do it on the next one. Um... Christina, uh, how do I tell my local reptile rescue that they're heating their snakes enclosures incorrectly? Um, are they though? What are they doing? What's what's? I don't have a lot of time left, but if you can answer this, what are they doing that's incorrect about it? Um, <laughs> Sprinkles. Uh, just gave a super chat for future Bob and Kent. That's really nice. I'll make sure to split that between the two of them. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, you guys, there was one more thing that I wanted to say. And now I forgot about it. I got that snake still sleeping up there. This snake, um, I'm going to put Lydia Dietz back. Let me see if I can figure out what I was going to say because I had, a th I had a thing. Hang on. She's just right under me here. There you go, young lady. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for being a co-host. Oh, uh, I was just going to explain what's going on with the videos. So the plan has been that because I, this is this is sort of my tour season right now, I'm gone a lot, which makes it more difficult to produce videos every week. And But I still want to put one out every week, so... That's why we're going three produced videos, one live stream, three produced videos, one live stream. Um, I, some of you know that I had COVID a couple weeks ago, so I was completely out for a week, which put me behind. Um, so now I'm back to, uh, I, I'm not ahead on any of my videos. In fact, next week's video is being shot tomorrow. So um, I'm still gonna try to do this, but we may do more live streams than I planned uh, because, <laughs> Um, I'm not as far ahead as I would like to be right now. So we'll see how this goes. But um, I appreciate you guys. I'm glad that you enjoy the live streams. I'm glad that you join me on them. I love talking to you. And uh, these are these are really fun. This is a different type of video, obviously, to do than, than a produced video. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you guys enjoy them. So anyway, I think this is time to end it. I got to teach in two minutes. So uh, you guys have a great night. Thanks so much. I will see you for next week's video and uh, in three weeks, maybe sooner, for the next live stream. Thanks, you guys. See ya.